Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fully Charged Show podcast. A um, couple of things I just want to mention uh, before we dive into this week's episode. Uh, literally, during the recording of this episode, uh, we announced that we are doing a an, an everything electric event in in Melbourne, Australia, in November of next year. So just over a year away. Uh, and it's just been announced this morning because I knew about it and I, I'd been to Melbourne and we talked to people and we'd been sort of planning it, but I haven't been in the loop for the last bit of organisation. So it is definitely going ahead. Really exciting. Uh, the shows in Australia are, and the, the kind of mood in Australia and the, the changes going on in Australia, really exciting. And it's kind of a privilege to be uh, involved in, even in a small peripheral way with that uh, transitional change. South Australia, basically 100% renewable most of the time. Western Australia, uh, as I've recently reported on the, the um, almost breaking news, is the most isolated grid in the world. And they are rapidly heading towards being 100% renewable. It's actually happening. It's not a theory. It's not an argument. It's not a discussion. It's a technological shift away from burning fossil fuel. Um there's that. Uh, there is the fact that uh, I can't remember what there is. There's nothing else. That's the big news. Obviously, we've been doing our show in March in Sydney. So we're doing two shows in Australia next year, which is really exciting. And there's there's more in the offing, but we're not going to say anything just yet. Uh, this week's podcast is with someone who's become a, a mate, really. He's just so brilliant. I've only known him a few years and he's been on the. He's been a speaker at our live events in the UK. His name is Tom Heap, and he's written this book. And I've got to say, I've got to put that in there so it goes in focus. How to give people and nature the space to thrive, and it's just a, a, he. It's a really, really interesting book, and we go into quite a lot of detail about it in this thing. But Tom Heap, for those of you who don't know, uh, outside the UK, it's a very, very familiar face and voice uh, in the UK both on television and radio, very specifically with the BBC. So he does a lot of different programmes with the BBC, one of which uh, is currently on BBC Radio 4, uh, and it's called Rare Earth, and he co-presents it with Helen Chersky, who is one of our wonderful presenters on The Fully Charged Show. So we're very proud to be involved with any of them because they're proper, clever people. So in 2021, he wrote a book called 30, 39 Ways to Save the Planet, and then this year, he's just published um, Land Smart. And I just want to say that if, you, if you're if you looking for a Christmas present for um, either a, a cynic who thinks that all the nonsense around carbon and uh, the climate change and electrification of transportation and renewable energy in very much in particular is nonsense, it might be worth giving them that book. One, it might annoy them. But two, they might actually learn something. But also anyone who has an interest in that. So the broadest spectrum of farming, food, energy, uh, land use, you know, forestry, eating meat, not eating meat, you know, growing vegetables, not growing, all those things. Solar farms, really interesting stuff. So it's very much focused on how we use the land and uh, that we're meant to look after. That's really our job while we're here on the planet. We should be looking after the land for the next generation and so on and so forth through time. And when we see the damage that's been done by previous generations who haven't looked after it for us, we don't like them very much. It's worth remembering that. How we reduce the amount of damage we do by producing food and what that food should be. I mean, it's a really... It's not a kind of specific to, I guess, the fully charged show and electrification, transportation, but very much to do with renewables because renewables need land or sea. But you know, most of the time they need land. And what do we do with that land and how do we use that land? Really interesting. Please, without more further ado or anything resembling it, welcome to the fully charged podcast, Tom T. This episode of the Fully Charged Podcast is brought to you by Ovo's Charge Anywhere. Charge Anywhere helps you power your car wherever you are, plan your route and pay. You'll have access to over 34,000 chargers across the UK's largest charging networks and more than 400,000 chargers across Europe. Setup is easy. Just download the Ovo Charge app, create your account add payment details, hit the road and start charging. There's no need to be an OVO customer either. 
Simply pay as you go or benefit from up to 15% off your charging with monthly boost packages. Ovos charge anywhere. Power your next journey with peace of mind. Uh, Tom, thank you very much for for taking time to talk about this. Well, I mean, it's your book, which I have to say, <laughs> I have taken time reading and I really enjoyed it. I'm just going to show it. Land Smart. Really clever take on it. And I mean, I think I wouldn't mind going back just briefly at the beginning for overseas viewers or people who haven't, who are not aware of your work, that where, how you got to what you're doing now, because you are such a familiar face and, and voice in particular for me. You know, it's it's. It, I've I've listened to you for many many. Well, I don't know if it's it's decades on the BBC. Yeah, both of us <laughs> on various bits of the BBC. But how did you? Where did you get into what you do now? What was your yeah. journey to get there? Um, so I was with uh, BBC News for uh, about fifteen years, and the right. latter part of that was as. Uh, science and environment correspondent and then rural affairs correspondent that kind of took me through the noughties and since then i've still been working for the beeb uh but on uh, other programs longer form programs both television and radio uh here in the uk country file is a very big sunday night show all about rural life environment countryside farming yeah. things like that and on uh, the the radio and podcasts uh costing the earth and now rare earth which is a uh, very much a, a deeper dive into all matters, environmental, wildlife, natural history and stuff like that. So that's the, the context of me professionally. And in the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, maybe up to 10 years, um, I've been aware that a lot of people have been coming up with what they call nature-based solutions. So this is this idea right. that we've got problems with the amount of wildlife we've got out there, lack of it, uh, the uh, uh, amount of food production, how that's made, obviously climate change as well, where we get our materials from, you know, how we're going to deal with floods, how we're going to get renewable energy. And all these things are demanding land and space yeah. on our land. And so the question was, in this kind of race for space on Earth, if you see what I mean, um, how do we do it? Can we do it? Who's doing it well? Yeah. No, that's good. And I think it's only fair to point out that your um, uh, partner on uh, on um, Rare Earth is a, is a very popular presenter on the Fully Charged Show, Helen Chesky. Your Chester. very own. Yes. No, well, I wish. <laughs> she's amazing. She's mine. She's not yours. <laughs> yeah, she's, yeah, we should argue about Helen. <laughs> We're very whenever she deigns us with her presence, we're very very grateful because she is we extraordinary. Did we name her in that conversation, Helen Chersky? Did we name her? I'm not sure we did. Anyway, we can. Yes, no, no, well, we have now, so we can ignore her completely from now on. Um, so then, you, the, the book you wrote for this, correct me if I'm wrong, Thirty Nine Ways to Save the Planet, but that was I was really intrigued by that as well. But I think this one's really grabbed me. I think because I suppose partly because that my first job was on a farm. Uh, oh, yeah. When I was a uh, fifteen, you know, I, I, and I still have one skill, I think, one mechanic or one driving skill, which is reversing trailers. And I don't <laughs> know how I learned to do it because I know I did an enormous amount of damage in the farmyard. <laughs> but when you reverse a tractor with a trailer on it, you see which way the, the wheels are going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it's like if I think for a second, if I consider intellectually how to reverse a trailer, it's hopeless. I can't do it. Mm. But if I go like I go uh, yeah. like that. And I do something. It's I'm I'm really good at it. It's the only thing I would say I'm really good at. Anyway, but I was so I've been aware of the impacts of farming, of what of the struggles that farmers have gone through really all my life in in phases. Mm. And I've known quite a lot of farmers, nothing like as many as you have. But so that starting point, I thought, well, I kind of know this. And then when I started reading about, I went, I kind of don't know anything. <laughs> I, was, I, I was supremely ignorant. But I love the way you started out because I do a lot of gardening, you started out in a way in your own garden, what you do in your small mm. bit of farm, <laughs> your garden and how that yeah. expands on. And that was fascinating. Yeah. So I, I thought there were some guiding principles that folk who have gardens, which is obviously in, in terms of readership more than the people who have farms, um, yeah. could, could give them a sort of a hanging on point to this. Yeah. Because one of the guiding thoughts throughout the book is that we need to think about multifunctioning our land, using it for more than one thing. Yeah. And when I, I looked out in in my garden here, here on, on on a sunny day, and indeed the the roof above my head, yeah. um, and the space that I'm in, so the space that I have control of, which isn't that big, it's probably about the size of a, a tennis court and a half, if if I include the allotment, maybe two. Um, 
within that, I've got uh, obviously shelter. Yeah. I've got um, uh, beauty, recreation in terms of the garden. I've got space for nature in that I try and manage it pretty well in, in, in terms of uh, what the local uh, buzzy and crawly things might like. Um, yeah. I've got some food because I you know, have a, a greenhouse with tomatoes and allotment, as I just mentioned. Um, I've got energy generation because I've got, in fact, two lots of the standard four kilowatt array right. on, on the place, one on a sort of garage building and one on the house. And because I've become a bit like a lot of uh, uh, weirdos of, of our kind of age, I've become obsessed by compost. Uh, oh, I love and, You can't beat compost. <laughs> and I now have an embarrassingly large number of bins out there doing different right. things. And so, I mean, that's good for the food production, but it's also good for soil carbon as well. Yeah. So there we go. That, that's, I don't know, five or six things that the little yeah. bit of my, how my house is doing, energy, carbon, um, shelter, housing, um, you know, wildlife, et cetera. Yeah. And I mean, that's certainly something that I've always been aware of that, uh, that we, the, where I live, where I live, we have a bit of extra space and I'm hugely, I realize I'm hugely privileged to have that because of things like I can have four compost bins. <laughs> Same thing. Mm. I've got room to have them. And I mean, obviously a lot of people can't, I thought it was very interesting. It was a, well, to look his name up, Mark Riz, Rizzle yes. Smith, yep. the urban gardener, but that was such a cool thing. Cause I've got some mates who grow way more sort of weird, interesting things than I do. I grow potatoes, carrots, beetroot, you know, really basic stuff. Mm -hmm, me too. And they grow amazing peppers and weird cucumbery things in tiny space. My daughter does yeah. it. Her front yard, which is a tiny yard in the middle of Bristol, loads of veg. She brought a cucumber wow. up there. I've never eaten a cucumber like it. And it was wow. grown near a main road in Bristol. You know, yeah, amazing. I mean, it is extraordinary what you can do in a small space if you've yeah. got the... Uh, the wit and to a certain extent the the, the time to do it and mark yeah. rizzle smith who you mentioned he's got a great book called Ver called vertical veg and a website yeah. for anyone who's interested in that kind of thing um you know he he proves that the variety you can get the the quantity you can get a little caveat on that in a moment um the quantity you can get and the engagement you can get out of yeah. it and the joy you can get out of it um he does say two things that 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 are a bit of a reality check. First of all, he says you'll you'll never get the well. It's very difficult to get the the big staples out of this. You'll always yes. struggle to get really big quantities of of of, of potatoes or an, or the sort of carbohydrate out of the small yeah. space. If you've got a allotment, you could get closer. Um, and and the other thing, which is a rather sad reflection, is that he's noticed particularly. He also has an allotment. And he's spoken to other fellow allotmenteers. He's up in Newcastle about this. Is that allotmenting has moved from being a working class activity to oh, a yeah. rather a middle class activity? Yes. And and, and the, the sociology of that is probably a book in itself. Yeah. But it is says something I think about uh, the, the the position uh, of food and labour and perceptions of, of that kind of labour within our society. But he does say, and I think he's right, that that is a slightly uh, unwelcome trend. Yeah, actually, you're absolutely right. Because now I th reflect on my grandparents. So my mother and father had a peculiar class. They, they jumped the class barrier. So my father, very working class, rural family background. My granddad, veg patch, everything in the garden was growing food. My mum's mum, posh, wouldn't dream of doing gardening. You know, middle class yeah. woman. She would. I mean, that was dirty. You get. You've got yeah. your hands in the earth, and yeah. that's completely flipped around. You're absolutely yeah. right. Because now the middle class family would. Have, oh, we grow all our own vegetables, and the, well, the working class family haven't got a garden as yeah. well. I suppose that's got a garden. There's issues with with access and time, and I think probably plays into this the relative cheapness of of, of food. food. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because as a proportion of our income, even for those on lower incomes, it has Still decreased small. quite markedly in recent yeah. decades. Um, the one I just want to mention this because I had you do mention at one point using human waste in, mm -hmm. in uh, as, as a fertilizer, and I did. Li I lived next to a house for well, I lived in a house for about six months of two houses, uh, uh, um, farmers' cottages in the middle of fields, and the garden was a, it's the most productive garden I've ever known in my life. The soil was phenomenal. It's in Oxfordshire, mm -hmm. and uh, the people that this was. We're going way back, Tom. You'll remember these times. This is in the 1970s. <laughs> and they were really proper, organic, you know, meditating, yoga practicing hippies. Good life, farmers. Yeah. Tom and Barbara. Uh, they had chickens. chickens. Yeah. But they were like very hippie ish, you know. They had, they had even longer hair than I did. I was challenged <laughs> by the length of their hair. But 
they buried their poo in the garden and they did a seven year cycle. So they didn't grow anything where the poo was and they buried it deep. And I helped dig the holes. It wasn't wow. like just scattered on the top. Neighbor. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, well, I used their loos because they only had earth closets. So it was very, okay. very basic house. No electricity in the houses. I've been past them. They're down a the lane. They're really posh houses now. They've got <laughs> electricity. <laughs> and they've got very ornate, well-manicured gardens, but very fertile soil, which I help fertilise. But is that something that's a, I would assume that is a challenge from a health point of view. You've got to be careful if you do that. Yes, I think so. I mean, I, I, I don't uh, advocate it or investigate it directly using right. your own fecal matter <laughs> to, to, to fertilise <laughs> your soil. I think your friend said that you know, clearly the right idea of you know yeah. burying it deep and leaving it time, because then I think the uh, the biology within it and and some of the microbes that might be perilous will have sort of got absorbed by the by the surroundings. However, um, as as a as a national notion. The idea of using our uh, waste material from both our own bodies, our food processing, uh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera, to, to make fertilizer and to use that on the fields is something I very, very strongly advocate. That right. principle, but put in a modern industrial clean yeah. setting. And people are doing that. In fact, I mentioned them briefly in this book, but also in the 39 Ways to Save the Planet, this company, CCM Technologies, who are, who are, who are trying to, to do that on a large scale and make right. it easy for farmers. So it's just another pelletized um application to the oh, soil right. but it's a fertilizer that hasn't got all the climate change impact of a chemical fertilizer both in its product or especially in its production but right. also in its use on the fields where famously nitrogen fertilizer traditional chemical fertilizer yeah. a lot of it just goes up into the atmosphere or down into the water or down into the rivers yeah because i mean that is one thing that i what, i don't think i got that from your book but that was it's been in the news recently the amount of uh, you know, I don't know what I call it, uh, treated sewage that's being... Because we have that on the fields around here, and we're very aware of it when they dump a yeah. huge pile of black stuff. Mm, mm. You can smell it. And it isn't like mm. a poo smell, but it's not the most delicious smell. No, it's not. But... And they and they spread that. I mean, but they've been doing that for years. That's not Indeed. new. So. But but uh, the stuff you're talking about is pe is that pellet? This isn't pelleted. This yeah, isn't it, it's taken a a, 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 a a quite a few further steps, and actually right. the combination at the, with um, uh, a sort of uh, food waste organic matter as well in it, uh, and and it is taken yeah quite a few stages further than that. And I've right. seen the pelletized form, and it doesn't have any particular. Well, it's not true; it has right. no scent. But you certainly yeah, don't so. think, oh, I'm yeah. you know rummaging through a bag of poo here. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. Let's move, Let's on, move yeah. on from poo. So I just had to, but I've completely forgotten about this this couple back back in the seventies who buried their poo. Mm. Anyway, the the other one, when I mean, that's another one that's very much been in the press recently, is the is the use of uh, uh, you know arable land or agricultural land for putting solar panels on. Ah, and you yes. do cover that, but I'm quite. There's one. Um, it's, it's less than one thousandth of UK land, it's, according to your book. Is yeah. Is, yeah. is that currently covered with solar? Would it be that currently be covered in solar? Um, and um, yeah, I mean, there's, cl there's clearly plans for more. And yeah. um, I mean, I'm a, I don't know if you want to get into it here, but I mean, I think we may as well. Um, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big fan of solar, as, yeah. as I know uh, you are as well. But in a, in a land analysis, there's a particular reason for that, and that is because. In, if you are going to use an area of land uh, for generating energy, that's if, you know, there are lots of other things and sometimes yeah. you combine it. But if you're doing it for generating energy, solar is so much better than the other thing that uses sunlight, which are plants. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's orders of magnitude. It's between, it depends how you measure it, but it's anything between 20 to sort of 300 times more, more energy the, yeah. you'll yeah. get from a square meter or a hectare of land if you put solar panels on it rather yeah. than growing some kind of biofuel crop, which you then have to burn. Yes. And so in a world where we are short of space, and I think we are, um, it is a really bad idea to be making biofuels out of uh, out of our land area. There, are, yeah. as you'll know, you read the book. It's actually a fairly pragmatic book. I'm not particularly idealistic yeah. or polemic about a lot of things. This is one of the few things where I see it in 
almost black and white terms right that um it's, it's not a good uh, not a good idea i think biofuels and there's a big threat from the airline industry here because yeah. they are eyeing up um uh biofuels as their get out of climate jail free card yeah. and it just isn't i mean if they start doing that in any serious percentages of the amount of f um airline fuel you know you really can kiss goodbye to your your rainforests and your savannas and your yes whatever, yes because they're just gonna yeah they probably That's won't do it problem. it's a huge error i mean the the, yeah. the stat that, that i think i've used and there are lots of stats you can do this i'll go i'll do one about uh transport because uh part of your empire is very interested in transport but <laughs> if, if if the um if the, the the predicted um transport fuel by 2050 there's a figure for that if just right. a third of that were to come from biological sources it would take the entire calorific production of the world's crops so in effect the entire of the world's crops just to do a third of our transport wow. by what's projected by 2050 so that, and when you say that that's everything we eat at present so yeah, we can't everything eat. we eat at, everything we eat at present would be just filling a third of our <laughs> fuel tank by 2050 i mean it, it's, it's so ridiculous just yeah. a nonsense i mean there are other yeah. ways of expressing it but the fact is that liquid fuels that are currently made from stuff <clears throat> excuse me largely currently made from stuff we get out of the ground too much are made of biofuels already but largely made of stuff yeah. that come out of the ground are incredibly potent and if we try to start trying to replace those with stuff that yeah. comes from biology sadly photosynthesis isn't very efficient only one percent of what the energy that falls from the sun is turned into carbohydrate by the plant right. by photosynthesis you know if we start demanding plants fuel our lives in a big style yeah. You know, other parts of our lives are going to vanish. In many yeah. ways, our lives are going to vanish. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. I don't want to go off on the topic too much, but it is fascinating yes. that, say, an airline executive, or, or in fact, a liquid any liquid fuel like top dog, can hear like biofuels. That really is a that, that is a solution, and then can say, "We really believe biofuels mm. are a solution going forward." And you yeah. go, "Well, they're really not. You know, yeah. but they don't care." They're not, and, and to be fair, I did speak to the, the. He's now no longer the chief executive of Rolls Royce. Chief executive of Rolls Royce, I think it was two years ago. Rolls Royce right. engines that was, and he actually he did admit. I mean, he did say no that this isn't this isn't the yeah. way forward. Um, yeah. uh, he's not in the job anymore. I don't think those two things are necessarily related. But I, yeah. I think there is some awareness if they stop and think for a minute. Yeah, it's got um, to be. That, yeah, that it can't what can't happen. Um, but then, could, so you explained very well how. Uh, solar and, and farming can go together because I mean mm. I've got to admit I'm pro solar but there, there's a particular bit of the M5 that you drive down and it's you know open fields and open country either side of you and then you go oh my god that is just like half a farm covered mm -hmm. in solar panels with grass and I did notice there were sheep in that field once I've seen as well as solar panels but you sort of think well there's a massive warehouse just down the road and that hasn't got any solar on the <laughs> bloody roof why you know they're yeah. inside of me that wants to make sure all the roofs are covered first oh, and then totally do the things, but... I mean, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. And I have a lot of sympathy with elements of the sort of anti um panel on fields lobby when yeah. they say it should be on roofs. You know, it absolutely should yeah, be should on be, roofs. Yeah. You know, I was just yeah, last week I was doing a country file about housing, it was in a bunch of new housing estates. Very, very few of the houses we've got oh. solar. Why not? I mean, it is. Yeah. You're banging your head on the desk. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm totally with you. <laughs> and it seems such an easy win. At the yeah. time of construction, putting so solar cheap. on, I mean, it's, I don't even... Well, the thing be, I heard the no other day, thousands, it's cheaper. You probably know better than I. Yeah, but it is cheaper per square metre to put solar panels on your roof now than tiles. Is that right? It's, it's a money-saving way of roofing, and it's so obscene that the yeah. builders who still live in the 1970s are not doing it. Yeah, no, but they're not being regulated. They're not being told no. to, you know, and yeah. uh, that that's the problem. And then, you know, you mentioned the warehouses. I mean, that gets quite a big outing in my book, as you'll know, and I speak yeah. to the, the boss of the uh, British Warehousing Association, and to be fair to her, she is pushing this very hard. She is right. pushing this at every opportunity. But the potential is enormous. I think yeah. the figure is that the, just those big distribution warehouses, so I'm talking the, the big new ones that are already up around the place, yeah. if they had solar panels on the top, I think that would equal our current solar generation in this country wow. so in effect it would double it so we'd double believe. it just on buildings wow. yeah ju just well just on those buildings on those I mean, buildings on yeah. those warehouse buildings right and so the potential there is is absolutely enormous and the reason why not one 
terrible reason one slightly less terrible reason the terrible reason is that it, it, there's complicated ownership structures and responsibility structures yeah, yeah. within these distribution who's going to pay who's going to agree blah blah, yeah. blah. i think that's a terrible reason that's a banging yeah. heads together exercise you know yeah. the other one is our friend the grid you know yes. I, some um people i've spoken to said look we we'd love to put panels on here but we've been to the grid and they say yeah you can do that in 18 years time you know? yes that that needs improvement and that is shocking isn't it no i heard from in fact greg jackson from Octopus Energy has a has the planning permission, the finance, and the technology to to install a huge solar farm up in in Yorkshire somewhere, and local planning and support for it. And he's got to wait eight, eight, exactly that eighteen <laughs> years for a grid connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 I think it, that will change. I think, and also he's prepared to pay for the grid connection, right? As well, part of that, yeah. and that might be there might be a thing where they can interlock there. There That's is a talk whole a bit of unlocking there, isn't there, with this new yes. uh, the new grid um, government? Yeah. Thing. I've forgotten what it's There's called. A whole, That's a whole other topic, anyway. Yeah. But one of the other ones, it was the the a really good way of looking at it is how how much land you need to produce one megawatt hour of electricity, which we've kind of hinted at with solar and biofuels mm. and everything. But I thought that was really interesting that. Well, the, effectively, it was it was nuclear came out very nuclear and mm. solar came out very well. Biodiesel mm. was an absolute mm. disaster. Wind, wind I mean, is pretty good as well, and wind, uh, yes, wind is very yeah, yeah. very good. I mean, slightly depending on how you measure it. I mean, there's the actual footprint of the turbine, which is basically pretty tiny, very small. There yeah. is a bit of disturbance in order to build it, in order to get access yeah. to it. That's a little bit bigger. If you want to include the visual impact, then you're talking something very large. Yeah, but, uh, that, yeah. Uh, that I'd say is a big. But if. then a visual impact of a nuclear power plant. You know, it can be impressive from a distance. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And I mean, the the other thing, and you may know this from your own work, uh, but it's something that really impressed me because people think, oh, those little patches on houses, they don't do very much. Yeah. I worked out from the amount of energy I've got from my solar panels over the years that each year I'm getting enough electricity to drive the average electric car twice the average annual mileage. So yes. just my roof is providing yeah. enough oomph for two cars. Yeah. And you think, that's extraordinary. In the old days, that would have been having, having a, an oil well and a refinery. Yes, in a and a refinery in, in your in car. In order to yeah. fuel my vehicle. I'm doing yeah. that from my own roof. And people yeah. can do that for now less than £5,000, um, yes. even a retrofit probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's just... No, a, those, a, yes, a no those things are all... Um, I mean, that was... And also, I mean, one of the... Because of my connection with Australia through my missus, the, the impact that rooftop solar's had there you could argue has been quite negative it's messed up their energy system completely it's it's bankrupting the old coal plants because peak use is in the middle of the day in australia for air conditioning and all that stuff well that's now more than completely covered with solar they have excess solar there's so much so much rooftop solar in australia that they literally don't know what to do with it i mean they're they're having to all the same things we're having with wind they're having with that but it's also transformed their grid structure, the way they buy and sell electricity, the cost of electricity is much cheaper there than here. All those things are, you know, it's had a really big, me- messy, because it's a disruptive industry, yeah. effectively, yeah. isn't it? And it yeah. has messed Definitely. things up there. Um, uh, wi- yes, I mean, wind stuff, that was a, another thing that reminded me, one of the things you talked about in the book reminded me of a, a project I've heard about in Australia where... There was going to be a wind farm in a rural area. Everyone was up in arms about it. Then they re- they re- cancelled it and said, we'll do it if you want to get involved. You can buy shares in the company. Da, da, da. Suddenly, there's a wind farm, and it's really <laughs> successful, and all the people who live near it love it because they actually they don't have an electricity bill. They make money. You know, They're actually having an income from it, and that's a kind of critically important thing, I think, in the next few years. I think it is. People have got to feel part of this energy transition, not have it yeah. imposed upon them. And you make a very clear example of that. But I think it, in other ways as well, I mean, it seems to me a bit of a no brainer yeah, that if you're putting a turbine in in a in an area where it will impact visually or otherwise the people who live there, that you either need to be thinking of options where they can make money out of it as well, or you're compensating yeah. them or whatever. You know, you can call this sort of bribery if you want, if you're but in in, in effect, it's saying no, this this is something that we're we're sharing the benefits yeah. with you. And yeah. uh, that's what should happen. Because was that I made a note of Bristol Doctor, I can't actually remember that. Was yeah. was is there an element of public ownership or of 
in, yes, in, you know, local there is. That. Um, right. I've just forgotten the name of the suburb of Bristol, but it's a, yes. a pretty uh, it's a pretty deprived suburb of Bristol where they uh, they are they with uh, basically own the big turbine, one of the few onshore turbines that actually went up uh, during the last Conservative government. Right one of two one of less than five anyway yeah um and um and and so they yeah they they borrowed money yes partly with with council backing so they could actually right. borrow money um but yeah they own the turbine and they will get the revenue from it uh obviously right. some of it uh goes into uh some of some of that revenue you know you spread to pay off the debt etc cetera, etc cetera. Right. what made me laugh slightly and that was that there was <laughs> It, obviously, being representing a, a low income area, on the whole, they're very against high electricity prices. When they right. start churning their own turbine, they confess to being a little bit conflicted because when, you know, they, getting a lot for their turbine meant right. they could put more, more for their community in other ways. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that's the definition of walking in someone else's shoes. They were yeah, walking absolutely. The well, then there's also, we should mention Ripple Energy in the UK, yeah. who've done an amazing job with, you know, selling shares in wind turbines that are. Well, now offshore, they're they're now investing in offshore. Oh, so that. That's their right. next step. Yeah, yeah so they're doing yeah. really well. Um, but uh, the other one that I always uh, get, I now get very depressed about biomass. Totally understand that, and the whole thing with the Drax power station importing wood chips from Canada. Let's not necessarily dive into that because it's, it's becoming so annoying. A bit of but, embarrassment, though, because but so also many um, I had an amazing uh, um, heart and lung specialist doctor who lives in London on the podcast recently because he drives an electric car in London because he actually sees the damage caused by diesel particulates, as right. in in people's actual yeah. lungs, you know. Right. So he's very aware of that. But then he really, I got really depressed because, and I knew he was right, but I was hoping he wouldn't mention log burning stoves, <laughs> but he did. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, and what and did of course, like? I've got one. We inherited one mm. when we bought this house many years ago. So, and I kind of still love it. You know, it's been part of my whole life is you burn logs in the winter. That's how you keep warm if you're in the rural area. But biomass, uh, um, well, actually, that burning wood produces half of all domestic energy on the planet. Is that, was that right? Did I get that right? For the I, global population? I think that's true because there's so many people in the global south are still... Yeah. Uh, burning wood for their energy it, for, for it, cooking really isn't but it? for it, cooking it? yeah, yeah. Uh, cooking some for water heating um yeah. But, yeah so and 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 in some parts of the cooler world for, for heating as well so it's yeah. still a very uh, big deal and it is a it is a problem in a number of ways because it obviously deforesting a bit in order to get the wood in the first place you've got the local air pollution that you just mentioned generally it's a quite a smoky thing yeah um uh, which isn't great in your kitchen particularly often women who are, who are doing the cooking are, are yeah. suffering from that and then you've got the climate change and then you've got the black soot that that goes in the atmosphere which which is in a, an yes. enhancer of um ice melting and and things like that yeah. so it's not good i mean i don't really get into this in the book but there's quite an interesting debate about whether it would be good to move those people from that to gas you know, yes. gas. Obviously, fossil fuel, yes, it is, but yeah. in many ways, many immediate ways, a lot less um, damaging for people's personal health and possibly planetary health. But quite an yeah. interesting debate there. Yeah, no, those are because there's just a, I've just reported on a report about how, how, um, you, you know, gas is more damaging than coal. Is the latest one? Oh, it's this like, is the thing about leakage and methane. Is it is leakage it that and methane and and, yeah. and burning it and everything? You know, the whole. It's okay. not. It's not a clean transition fuel. Right. Is the argument? I don't know enough about it to know how true but that you've is. Just done a commentary on it, so I might have to read that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, now, fertilizer is a, is a, because of the connection with fossil fuel. So, can we get that right? Because when I often just spout out, we don't just use fossil fuel for fuel. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you know, we uh, we don't use oil oil for fuel. We use it for I know pharmaceuticals and, and uh, plastics and all the other as mi a myriad of products. But we do we get actual fertilizer? Is nitrogen fertilizer a, effectively a fossil fuel based product? Yeah, yeah right. it is. It absolutely is. I mean, the actual the the the, the process of making it, the chemical reaction that makes it involves uh, natural gas usually. Right. Um, so if that is a fossil fuel. The energy to make it is nearly always derived from fossil fuels. Uh, so those two things are, 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 are clearly fossil fuels. And you know, there's, there's quite an interesting argument that basically says 
a lot of the world's population is being basically being fed on fossil fuel because right. that's where a lot of the uh, chemicals originated from. Uh, but it is a real dilemma, this, with fertiliser, yeah. because uh, given the successes of the Green Revolution that happened in the late 20th century yeah. and of, of increasing global food production to match global population or in some ways to exceed it, which a lot of is, is, is many people thought was a miracle in itself. A lot of people were predicting mass starvation in that period. Yes. It didn't happen. Yeah. Fertiliser can take a lot of the credit for that. Yeah. Um, and... So people say that, you know, you can argue that half to a third of us in the world today are being kept alive by fertiliser. And yeah. so if we change the way we farm um, and, um, you know, I think uh, I don't think that's, a, you know, I think that's a, required, actually, in many yeah. ways. We need to be very careful about doing it. We need to find new ways of farming, new types of crops and new methods of creating fertiliser, some of which we yeah. talked about earlier. Yes, yeah. I, mean, I think one of the critical things of that, which is another one of those where I know that vegans are right. <laughs> I totally get it. And I do think they are absolutely right. But <laughs> it's the same struggle. You know, if I eat some, you know, roast chicken in front of my log fire, I just, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do two things, those two things. I'd feel, I'd feel too guilty. <laughs> and I was a vegetarian for about eight years and I've slipped yeah. off, the, off the wagon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm, I'm still minimal. I'm in very, very minimal amount of meat, but I do occasionally have some mm -hmm. meat mm -hmm. and fish. But that the, the statistics of beef farming in particular and the map, I think you've got an amazing map which shows how much land is used to produce yeah. beef is, is yeah. stunning. I mean, I mean, this is the map. I'll just actually get it up. To that. I'm gonna, I'm it's gonna a great map. It it's just pretty really much the only punches illustration you in the guts, in the book. Um, people can, 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 can yeah. Sort of, so that dark colour that yeah. goes from sort of north of Birmingham to Scotland, that's yeah. beef. What, yeah. what actually that map is, and people, if they want to look at it, they can look at the National Food Strategy where, where right. uh, Henry Dimbleby uh, created. But basically, that's a map of the proportion of the country that's given over to different land uses. Yeah. And what you see from that is more than half of the UK is given over to pasture farming. That's actually sheep and cows. Right. Um, right. Uh, and also within that included is the area of crops grown for their feed to feed them right and that's about it's about half to two-thirds in the uk globally it's, it's close to two-thirds but a similar kind of proportion right. so the demand uh of livestock on land is huge yeah and there are people you just mentioned them who would say look all this production side is stuff that you've got in your book it's all very well but actually we just need to change our behavior yeah if we ate less we wasted less and we ate less meat, we could solve this space race. We could win, you know, humanity and nature could win this space race tomorrow. Right. The problem is that advocating for behavioural change is very easy for those who've already made the change. Yes. <laughs> and um, uh, it is very hard to get behavioural change um, uh, instantly and, and, and unwidespread. And so actually my view of this, a bit like yours, is in many ways... The, the, there's a lot of, you know, in some ways they are right. The, 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 there is a solution to be had there. But yeah. I live in the world as it is, not as I want it to be. And yeah. So whilst I think we could see more effort from the government and, and from institutions uh, on all those three things, our wastes, yeah. waste and meat, <laughs> yes. um, I, 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 I'm kind of realistic about the the, the the potency or, you know, the fact that they are not a panacea because yeah, yeah. they're not. Um, but I, but I do think they're important. Yeah, and I mean globally, the thing. I mean, I've, we've done a lot of stuff about China and what's happened to China in the last forty years. I think, and India is fair to say that there are literally billions of people who could never have afforded to eat meat forty yeah. years ago, who now can, and that mm -hmm. means the meat production is. Has, I mean, I don't know if that. I don't remember that statistic, but I'm assuming meat production has increased in the last 40 years by a considerable It amount. has, and I think I, my memory of this, uh, I'm not sure I'll quote this direct, directly in the book, but actually it has gone down. and It's plateaued in America, and I oh, think right. it's gone down a bit in Europe. Um, so the, and India, I think, is still, in India is still largely a vegetarian country. Yeah, yeah. Um, in China, it's gone up, and the, and, um, the other booming areas of population, sub-Saharan Africa, I think, you know, is coming into more into their diet because there isn't so much a, a cultural or a religious antipathy towards it. Yeah. So it's seen as a luxury. And as you know, as people develop, they tend to get more luxuries. Yes, yeah. 
So one of the, just to, I don't want to harp on about meat too much because I'll probably have some in the next week, but the, the you know, some of the, the arguments about, you know, deforest, cutting down rainforest, planting soy, feeding the soy to cows, eating the cows. There's a lot of energy consuming and land consuming mm -hmm. steps to produce what probably ends up as very cheap meat. But I mean, that's a. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And, and and I think it, it's, there's a really interesting issue here about how your animal is reared and how that fits into our story of climate change, yeah. animal welfare, and indeed um, farming more generally. So on one side, this sort of intensive system where soy is often part of it, in some yeah. ways um, it could be considered more climate friendly because unfortunately if your animal's skipping about having a lovely time in the field, all that right. longer life, and exercise and, and if you like oh, pleasure happiness. for the animal isn't you know isn't, isn't very efficient in yeah. terms of turning sunlight into food for us and so yeah. the carbon footprint often of an animal that's had a, a lovely life is often much higher often wow. okay. it's often much higher than one that's had a rather industrial and grim life yeah. that's a problem needs to be debated but on the other hand we mentioned earlier uh, about having to find ways of farming and producing enough food with that less, much less chemical fertilizer and in a much less sort of traditional system. A lot of people say animals are a critical part of providing the soil fertility that we right. will need to do that. Yeah. So animals as part of a fertilizer system and animals a certain extent as sort of fed on waste or as a sort of waste disposal unit, <laughs> I, I think are a, a very plausible idea and might have you know a, a better life so yeah. i i think it's much i think if you're an absolutist and um had you know animals completely out of the system apart from being idealistic that i think we mentioned earlier i think there are some considerable hiccups in that right. in, in, in terms of our future farming yeah i mean because millions of cow or well, hundreds of millions of cows have got to produce gargantuan amounts of cow poo i mean well the one thing that i yeah. always remember made me really not buy an impossible burger when i was working in california was we just where we were filming we drove past uh an animal feed an animal uh, slaughterhouse and and uh, yard a massive yard on a scale i had no notion that anything could be on that scale i mean it was like half an hour driving past animal pens full of cows and we knew before we got there because we could smell it and, uh, and it was a big slaughter yard and, a, I mean, a massive industrial unit in yeah. somewhere north of Los Angeles out in yeah. the boondocks. And, and that was like, you know, when you see it in real life, you go, that is quite a shocking way for the human race to operate. Yeah. You know, regardless I just got a bit confused enough. at the start of that, Robert, because you said it made you not buy an Impossible Burger. Isn't an Impossible Burger? Oh, sorry, no, not, not an Impossible Burger, an In-N-Out Burger, sorry, which I had one and I loved it and it was, you know... <laughs> The franchise of In-N-Out Burgers is very supportive of the local community. All those <laughs> arguments you hear. And then you go, oh, but this is where the, the In-N-Out Burger yeah. comes from. No, not an impossible, the exact opposite of the impossible burger. <laughs> yes, well done. Thank you for picking me up on that. No, I do I do quite like the impossible burgers. I had one here in the UK recently. I think you I can get them here. I mean, just coming back briefly to our, you know, eating less meat. I mean, there's yeah. no doubt that helps enormously in the transition. Yeah. That just the the, the plant-based options, both in terms of fake meats, but also just in terms of recipes and knowledge and awareness out there of what you can do, has just made that the low meat lifestyle a lot more pleasant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know what the impact, because that's another thing I've heard arguments I, on both sides of that, the impact of producing the basic ingredients to make a, an impossible burger. I mean, then it becomes so complicated, the yeah. arguments. I can, I, um, that's I, beyond I, me, but... I think, but I think generally, and this refers to the remark you made earlier about the complexity of you know taking sunlight to grow a crop, which you then yeah. put it with them goes into an animal. I think most people agree. I mean, there are some figures in my book that actually a, a an area of land um, will produce if if you if you just take the crop off it will generally be between around fifteen times more calories or more protein from right. that area of land of using it as a plant, consuming using it as a plant, it as meat. Right. than having turned it into meat yeah. as, as a rule of thumb. So just yeah. in terms of land efficiency, I think um, that th th those figures apply. Of course, there are some areas of land where it's pretty difficult to grow uh, yes. for human consumption, yeah. and that's another area. But, uh, one one of, I mean, one of the last things that I'd love to just quickly cover, well, well no, a couple of things, but 
one of the things that caught my eye was the that there is a I probably got this wrong now. I wrote it down, but th that we are losing rainforest in in sort of tropical and subtropical areas, but we're gaining forest yeah. in like nor the northern hemisphere, which I think we never hear. Or you would all normally hear the sort of shocking yeah. news, you know, fifteen thousand million acres have been of uh, rainforest cut down, and then there's nothing yeah. else, yeah. which is bad. But but we're at, so there are are there more because it feels like where I live, there's more trees now than when we moved here thirty five years ago. Well, that that is probably true, and certainly right. across Europe, it, it it's definitely true. I mean, the, right. the forested area of Europe has grown quite dramatically. Forgive me, I don't know the the figure exactly at my fingertips, right. but uh, it has, um, and and that is quite interesting as to how that's happened. Now, uh, some of that is uh, planted, but not all. Right. Some of it is is natural expansion. There have been areas, um, here, particularly in southern Europe, where uh, the forest area has increased uh, right. through land abandonment, which some people think is a, a bad thing. I think it's funny how land yeah. abandonment carries negative connotations. Yes. Rewilding carries positive <laughs> connotations. In effect, it's, 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 it could it's be the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Um, some of it's obviously through through managed plantations, and some of those those plantations vary in terms of their uh quality for for wildlife and indeed for carbon storage but um uh the, it, it is definitely true that that area is expanding and i, I met a really good forester uh, we we don't talk about forestry uh much it's interesting it, it, yeah because maybe for britain it's not considered to be a a, a huge industry but yeah i mean the forested area of britain is increasing not fast enough but it is increasing from right. i think the low point was around the sort of 19th century um i think we're now up to uh, it's a i think it's about 13 percent in the uk it's a higher percentage in scotland lower in england but the, right. the the forest that i met uh a, a young woman up in uh just south of edinburgh um and and her approach to forestry which i thought was really interesting was instead of um, having a big air and then clear felling the whole lot, and right. then you sort of, which is an incredible shock to the sort of natural system. It must be, yeah, yeah. Um, her approach was what's called continuous cover forestry, which is right. that you find the most valuable tree and you pull that tree out. Right. You cut it and pull it. Now, you might get, um, uh, it, it's a more expensive system per cubic metre of wood, for the actual wood but it's less harming to nature and also makes your forested area less exposed to disease and other and, and, right. and less vulnerable to um when uh, weather damage and, and and things like that and works well with her kind of slightly smaller forestry operating they've got their own timber yard etc right. the, the timber can be of a higher value it's not all just going into you know fence panels and wood chip it's going in into things of greater value the, the, yeah. the joinery world um, and I thought that was really, really interesting. And you know, she thought productive forestry had an an important plant to play. It's often painted as the bad guy. She, yeah. she thought managed correctly, it can definitely be the good guy. Once again, helping with those multifunctional things of, you know, providing a use in this case, a, a timber, a material for humanity, you know, a home for nature and a carbon store, um, yeah. and indeed floodwater storage because uh, forests are pretty good for that as well, reducing yes. speed of runoff. But I mean, that is, I mean, I wonder whether you came across this in your conversations with people. I mean, that the, particularly I've been in Canada recently, they, you know, they've had the most horrendous forest fires of, in their history. The floods, every time I look at the news, there's some, hor another, hor Ardèche, there's actually a town I know in the southern, Fr southern France, in the Ardèche region, that is, was effectively swept away really? last week. I mean, really recently with phenomenal heavy rain in a, in a, like in a 24 hour period. And yeah. you see cars being washed down streets. Th those images are becoming very common in particularly in Eastern Europe in the last, yeah. this year. Yeah. I mean, is I that, mean, is that a, like, if you speak to a farmer in Derbyshire now, like on country value, I mean, is, yeah. is the concept of the changing climate discussed, acknowledged, yeah. right? It is yeah. most definitely, most often in terms of the weather becoming um, bigger and blockier. As in, right. you know, we don't know if this summer is going to be, a, you know, really dry or, or, the next or really wet. Be really yeah. wet, but yeah. it tends to happen in big blocks that make yeah. farming planning extreme. And this year, I mean, there's been a 
is the case in point. I think it was a stat uh, about uh, about a month ago, having been the worst harvest on uh, second yeah. worst harvest, I think, uh, for for decades last right. year. And that was because of the you know difficulty of harvest, difficulty of planting, and actually they're having the same planting problems this year for next year because it's a very uh, a very wet. Very autumn. wet. So that yeah. is a big deal. So they're very aware of that. I mean, interestingly, some of the plant, some of the farming methods that we're talking about do make your farm much more resilient to that. You know, if you have a right. better quality soil, yeah. it will hold more water and that is a stops flooding because you're holding more water in that field but yes. also it provides more water when when there's a, there's a dry period so yeah. that is that is definitely coming the case and it's driving uh, i mean <laughs> driving a lot of farmers to distraction if they weren't you know weather was always the big unknown for them but it's sort of become that squared <laughs> and yeah. is he pushing a, and interestingly, well, a lot of farmers are saying, "Well, I, I've got to find some kind of indoor farming system right. because I can control it, you know, yes. and I need that control because, I, you know, I could vaguely rely on the weather out there in the past, yeah. but I can't now." Wow, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah, but the, the, I mean, one of the other ones that I've certainly has been a big change since I was a kid working on a farm is what I remember then in the, and this is in the kind of Oxfordshire flatlands on mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. Thames Valley, mm -hmm. but, you know, huge fields ploughed in the autumn and then left. And, and now all the fields around where I live now, they're never bare earth. Really? They've got, well, they, they, they grow, they, they, I yeah. don't know what they cover do. Crop, but cover crops and things, yeah. Cover crops, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it seems to be, a, that's really taken off. Actually, well, you know who the farmer is because he works with the on country farm. It's oh, right. Henson's yeah. farm. That Mr. Henson, yeah. <laughs> Basically, this is the most inside whatever that you could possibly have. It's like we both work with Helen Chesky and Adam Henson's my neighbour and you work with him. Anyway, yes. Yeah. But so yeah, that, I guess that's what he's. Yeah, they're do, they're doing cover crops. I, I guess. Yeah, they are. And and this, um, but I shouldn't paint current uh, f f current sort of traditional farming in, entirely in a bad light because a no. lot of these moves towards um, protecting your soil, getting more carbon in it, respect for the worms, uh, you know, love for the soil. Yeah, is definitely you know taking root. If you'll pardon the pun, within conventional farming and the yeah. overlap between what might be called regenerative or even some of the organic principles and uh, conventional farming is much greater than it has been in the past. I mean, it needs to go further and faster, but it is definitely happening. Yeah. And I think just to be fair to Adam and to explain to people who don't know, you know, from outside the UK, he's not a kind of hip he's not like the hippies that i lived with in the 1970s <laughs> who who has horse drawn plows i mean no, the, the, the biggest tractors i've ever seen in my life are at his farm <laughs> you know they are massive machines and you know extraordinary stuff so yeah anyway well also mr clarkson around the corner must be quite close to you and, and he's he is doing, quite close he's actually doing quite a lot of interesting things on his farm I and mean, a lot of it you know for televisual enjoyment perhaps yeah. but nevertheless he is doing something mean, experimenting with some quite interesting and uh, been, regenerative farming practices. I think I and mean, it's annoying because I don't want to like anything he ever he's ever said or done <laughs> but that's just me personally but I think it's an extraordinary program and really popular around the world it's kind of explained hmm. a lot of and I, I think explained farming to a lot of people who would never you know they watch it because of him and suddenly they're seeing something completely different yep. from their normal output and also good. he did mention in the la I think in the last series that the climate's changed where he lives, you know, and, that, and those, we have to do something about it. But can I carry on driving my Range Rover? <laughs> yeah, all good, clean fun. Um, yeah, that's what the last thing, because I don't know how much you've seen of this. I, I actually test drove an electric tractor on uh, on Adam's farm. Well, a few right. years ago, and we had to go. We had to go. We had a diesel one and an electric one. Basically, they just did exactly the same thing. There was no difference. Uh, you know, and the the electric one can do a full days, a full shift on a farm on one charge. It doesn't need recharging. But is that something? You know, I'm seeing quite a lot of heavy plant machinery, like uh, quarrying stuff, big diggers becoming electric. You know, big companies, JCB, Volvo, those sort of people doing it. I haven't seen as much in this country. Uh, you know, like electric tractors or combines or no. I think it's a little bit slow. I've mean, seen electric quad bikes. Um, yes, they struck me as quite a good idea. Yeah. Some stuff in, in 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 tractors as well. I mean, I guess uh, you still, you know, to a point. I mean, you'd know more about this than me. You got this, you know, power density. Uh, yeah, yeah, in inverted yeah. commas, the incredible power density of diesel. Um, yeah. 
having said that you would have thought you know the one thing that you're not doing with those kind of vehicles is generally going many many miles from no. home. so no. you know the idea that you could you know you can recharge um at, at, at the end of the day or even halfway through the day in, yeah. in your lunch break so i would have thought that is i mean uh, th there is a lot of um, you'd know this actually from having worked on a farm and also your sort of scrap heap challenge days even with modern farming there's a lot of what can i do to repair and maintain on my own farm yes that's true and, you yeah. know technology that you know engineering yeah. that you know is uh, something much to be desired um yeah. I suspect yeah. in that yeah. and, the, and the, the complexities and i suspect the upfront expense of some of these electric technologies and just yeah. the fact that they're new and we all know that for a, quite a while new things can be temperamental actually so it doesn't yeah. like an electric car but um you know they can be um yeah. uh, and and I, I suspect that that puts well oh, puts farmers off and i just think the other thing we should mention is for an awful lot of farmers their margins are tiny yeah. they haven't yeah. got the financial luxury of experimenting with things yeah. they're hand to mouth in terms of the yeah. amount of money they're making and this applies not just to the technology you're talking about but also some of the changes in farming practices i've been talking about earlier right you know it, it's notable that the people who are doing that are often the people with the money it, it's right, the dysons right. it's the uh, ones that have the big you know pepsico contract you know yes. uh, in pepsi cola uh, or you know those uh, organizations are exp are doing more of this stuff i think it's partly because they have the money and also partly because they are measuring and being measured on their climate and carbon and and, and nature yeah. footprint and yeah. so as we know what's measurable becomes important but i i do think a big part of this is it's difficult for farmers to make the change and, and finding ways to make that with that less risk to them is really important yeah Tom, this is, I mean, it's been really good to talk to you. And I just, I do want to genuinely plug your book. It's called <laughs> Land Smart. Please and do. it is really good because I think that is really the last thing I wanted to say. And I actually, this is what I wrote. I don't want to be rude and my knowledge of farming is limited, but I will claim the majority of people have no idea where their food comes from and they don't care. And it's been your job in many ways to, <laughs> to challenge that you know the, the, and we all do it i mean i do it all the time i'll buy a loaf of bread doesn't occur to me like i used to buy petrol and never thought where does this bloody stuff come from i just moan about the price but it is something that i think is worth more people being aware of you know because that then it, it that does affect your choices and your attitudes and when you drive through the country or go in a train through the country you go it's just fields and yeah. trees and stuff yeah a lot going yeah. on there which is you know often ignored well thank you very much and you know my my contention is that if we do it smartly we can get this right and to be absolutely yeah. clear to your listeners and viewers most of my book is reporting from people who i think are doing a really good job and, and trying yeah. to learn from them and it is fairly optimistic in being it is. able to solve yes. these yeah. problems if 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 i think we we get this right but yeah. uh thank you very much indeed for the time Really hope you enjoyed that. Uh, Tom's just such a great guy, isn't he? It was such a pleasure, pleasure to talk to him. And uh, well, certainly he'll be coming back on the show in the future. I'm sure we'll do other things with him because he's very, very well informed about all that stuff. Uh, please do uh, subscribe to the Fully Charged Show and the Everything Electric Show. That would be wonderful. Tell your friends about it. Do spread the word. And we're continuing to um, create huge amounts of quality programming. Notice I didn't use the word content. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our live events that are coming up in 2025. And uh, that's it, as always. If you have been, thank you for listening and watching.